Well, we've done it again. Something about filming these off-grid series and we find these spectacular locations. This one, we're at Swimcart Beach in eastern Tassie near the Bay of Fires. It's beautiful. It's stunning. It's probably not the best swimming spot for kids, but other than that, it's perfect. It looks bloody magic. So if you want to check out more of what we get up to, make sure you subscribe to the channel and, uh, yeah, we'll be putting this one into our travel vlog in the coming weeks. But this video is all about safety and security. So we put a call out on our Facebook and Instagram a little while ago for our off-grid series and safety and security questions were by far the number one question you guys asked us. How do you find good free camps that you feel safe? How do you keep your van safe? How do you go on day trips and leave, you know, your stuff with no one there? So yep. This is what we're going to cover off uh, today along with our first aid gear and what we use in an emergency and what we've thought about and how we think about first aid. Yeah, so we've sort of tried to categorise it into precautions that we take to prevent something happening and then of course what we have uh, equipment wise and how we think about uh, what we would do if an emergency situation did arise. So let's dive into it. Let's jump in. Oh, before we do, oh, that's we've right. got a $100 voucher for Everything Caravan Camping to give away and congratulations to Stuart Smith. Stuart Smith. Stuart Smith. Congratulations to Stuart Smith. Um, You've you won a hundred dollar voucher for the last off-grid video, the yeah. power setups video. So yeah, flick us an email. We've comment, we've left you a comment, but yeah, flick us an email and we'll send you the voucher back. So enjoy. I think it's important to note that all of our risk tolerances is, are going to be different. What we're comfortable with and what the average person is comfortable with or what you're comfortable with is going to vary greatly. So I think the number one thing is figuring out what your risk tolerance is and what you're going to be comfortable with. There's no point watching this video or anything else and doing any other research and sort of saying, well, that's okay for them, so that's going to be okay for me and that you're then going to feel comfortable, safe, secure. At the end of the day, the number one most important thing is to make sure that you feel safe and secure or as safe and secure as you possibly can. If there's anything that you're, not, that you're doing that you don't feel safe, it really is worth reconsidering uh, the way you're traveling or what you're doing and where you're traveling and things like that. I think there's a real misconception as well about how unsafe or how bad certain areas of the country are to travel in and what the likelihood and chance of something going wrong. But I think a lot of people have this real fear around uh, someone or uh, interfering with their travels. So someone attacking them or trying to steal their, their belongings or, or whatever it might be and really threatening their personal security. We actually feel like the, op the chance of that happening in Australia is extremely low. It very, very rarely happens. Uh, there are situations where, uh, in certainly in particular areas around the country, where theft is an issue, um, but it's generally people are just trying to take your stuff. There's very rarely situations in our country, and we're very fortunate for this, and we should all be very appreciative and grateful for this, is that it's an extremely safe country to travel around. It is very rare that you hear of any time where anyone's personal security has been uh, threatened. When it's one of those situations where when things do go wrong, they tend to get really well publicized and blown out of proportion. And it's very easy to forget how rare those things actually are. And statistically, if you think about how many people are traveling all the time uh, and camping and traveling into off-grid and remote areas, how infrequently anything actually does go wrong. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. We feel in almost all areas of this country, we can comfortably travel in and feel safe and secure. But that being said, we also travel in a caravan that we're able to lock ourselves into and it is fairly secure. And we'll go into that in more detail in a minute, but it is gonna depend on your setup, uh, how you're traveling. If you're able to, you know, if you're, if you're camping in a ground tent, for example, you're gonna have different security or safety requirements and you may not travel to areas or spend time in areas for as long as what we do. Uh, because we do have that extra security of having four solid walls around us and being able to lock ourselves in. Now, along with our risk tolerance, we're also going to have a different amount of precautions that we're going to want to take uh, that are going to make each of us feel safe and secure. What we might be comfortable with as far as precautions we're taking, whether it be emergency communications or the level of first aid we've got or our own security, things like that, that's going to vary from person to person greatly. So while what we do suits us, it may not necessarily suit you. You may want to go further and have more contingency or more, uh, more equipment to be able to deal with emergency situations, or you may be less inclined to feel the need to do that. And that's going to depend on, again, where and when you travel, how you're traveling, uh, when you're going to those areas, all those sorts of things are going to impact 
the precautions that you might feel comfortable taking uh, or whether you might see certain things as overkill or unnecessary. Something else that I think it's really important to point out is that off-grid doesn't always mean remote uh, and remote isn't always <laughs> off-grid, although it generally is, and that you don't actually have to be that far from a major town or city to be quite remote and to have to take um, some consideration or have to put into consideration how remote you are and how far you are from help should something happen. A good example of this is uh, one of our favourite camping spots when we were living in Canberra was Blue Waterholes in the northern section of Kosciuszko National Park. Now as the crow flies, the Blue Waterholes campground is less than 100 kilometres from Canberra itself, uh, but it is about a three hour drive as you have to travel around uh, the wilderness area to get into it. But it is also outside of phone service. The nearest phone service from that campground is about a half an hour drive. And all the towns that are around that campground are quite small. Kuma and Chumut would be the biggest towns and they're over an hour's drive away from that campground. So although looking on a map, the Blue Water Holes campground certainly doesn't look or feel that remote. If, some, if you were camping somewhere like that and things were to go wrong, you do have to consider how quickly and easily you'd be able to get access to help. So I think a big one is people often ask us, you know, how do you pick where you're going to stay? How do you decide where you're going to stay and how safe it is? And, and to get a feel, I guess, for understanding where might be safe to camp and where might be less safe. And I, I really don't want to go into too much on this because I think there's a lot of irrational fear about this when traveling in Australia. As I said earlier, Australia is an insanely safe country to travel. The opportunity for people to get into strife um, through someone else's wrongdoing towards them is so incredibly rare that I don't think it should be a huge consideration. But you, at the same time, you want to take some basic pre precautions and, and have a bit of common sense to make sure you don't end up in a situation where that's going to happen. So the biggest one for us is um, we use wiki camps, as you guys know, for finding a lot of our campsites and stuff. And often those reviews in those, in those campsites will give you a pretty good indication of what other people's experience has been camping there. And although that may not mean it's necessarily safe or necessarily unsafe, it will start to give you a bit of an idea of if things are happening in that area, if there is any regular trouble, I guess, or any locals that might be traveling that area that you may not want to come across or, or things like that. Yeah. And in the same way, we disregard certain information from those reviews as well, if it's not relevant. Like if someone's whinging about their next door neighbors playing loud music and that ruined their campsite, those campers are not going to be there when we show up. Like it's not, That's it's right. not relevant information. But if there's a, a continuous thread of, oh, had someone try and break into my car, and five people have written it, probably something you should think about paying attention to. I wouldn't to. go to that campsite. <laughs> yeah, another one might be like we have seen reviews on some campsites, and we've seen them ourselves, where there's a lot of permanent campers or semi semi permanent campers. And you people just got a, a vibe. You just get a feeling about a place. Sometimes we've pulled into them, and you just. Something about it, it's sometimes hard to put your finger on. We just don't feel comfortable staying there. Again, a lot of that may be irrational and unfounded, but if we don't feel safe, we don't stay there. Uh, there's no point just trying to push through that and go, oh, no, it should be fine, and then you just don't have a great night's sleep because you're constantly <laughs> you just, worried about it. Yeah, exactly. All it's doing is ruining your night's sleep, so you may as well drive an extra 30 minutes to a different campsite where you do feel safe. Exactly. Yeah. So apart from Wikicamps reviews, the next biggest one is probably just talking to locals and other travellers. So talking to people that have travelled to the area you're going to and finding out where they stayed, what they thought of it, things like that, uh, how they felt is, is a good way to get that information, as well as talking to locals, particularly as you go more remote, uh, asking in places like the local pub, tourist information centres, all those sorts of things to get an idea of what camping options are around, but also uh, what the sort of feeling on the ground in that local area is as far as security goes and whether there's been any regular problems or anything like that. But I think really when it comes down to it, the people out there that are doing the wrong thing, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're just trying to flog some of your stuff, steal your stuff, and they're just opportunistic most of the time as well. Yeah. This is a really interesting one. So although as you get more and more remote, um, camping off grid, you can feel less and less safe. We actually feel like in a lot of the time that a lot of the time you're actually more safe. Yeah. Think about it like Liz I've has a great an analogy an with an a lion. An analogy like if a lion is going to hunt, it doesn't go walking off into the scrub in hopes that it might find you know an, an animal, easy an easy target. 
it's going straight to the waterhole. It's going where all of the ca campers and caravans are. It's going to the caravan parks, it's going to the camps in town. So it's sort of like we are most precautionary when we are in a town yeah. where it's with, with other travellers. That's the time we make sure we've locked everything up, we've made sure our stuff's stowed away. That's, that's when we're most precautionary. When we're out down a dry riverbed off a side track, no one knows no we're there. No one knows we're there. And you wouldn't and be able to find us even <laughs> if you did know we were there. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, it it is perspective, but it comes with time too. Like, I remember the first time we went camping, um, free camping in a swag. I was panicked till about 3, 4 a.m. Yeah. I reckon. I was just like huddled up going, I hope no one comes to get me. <laughs> I'm like, it's so irrational. Yeah, and I was lying in the swag saying, come on, it'll be right, don't yeah, worry yeah, about it. No one knows where you're Go to sleep, Liz. But and the I trouble is too, once you get it in your head that you you feel unsettled, it is really hard sometimes to calm yourself back down. Yeah. But like Liz is saying there too, it is something that you get more and more comfortable with the more you do it. So don't Absolutely. don't feel bad if the first time you go and do it, you chicken out, <laughs> so to speak, and, yes. and have to run back into town or, or go and find some other campers and start slow. Like try and find some quite remote and off-grid campsites where there's other travellers there and other campers there because that can often make you feel a bit more secure. And Go with friends that you know are going to help help you out as well. Yeah. And I would just say on that too, if there are other campers in a campground when you arrive or they arrive after you've arrived and you want to feel a bit more safe and secure, go and say good day. Yeah. Introduce yourself because suddenly they go from being a stranger and someone who you might, you know, who you don't know and don't know anything about to even just a quick five-minute conversation about where they've been traveling, what they've been up to, you'll get a pretty good idea pretty quickly of what sort of person they are. And I think then you have a better night's sleep knowing what type of people and, and the type of people you've got around you, yeah. for sure. Probably the next biggest one is, yeah, where we decide to, it's safe to leave our van or if, you know, if you're towing a caravan camp or whatever it might be, or even if you're not towing, a lot of people leave their tent or their belongings in a campground while they go on a day trip and explore. How do you figure out if that's safe or not? Well, it, it's a lot of the same things with the personal security. It's it's using those wiki camps reviews. It's also talking to locals, talking to other travellers, getting a feel for uh, if there's been any issues in the area and things like that. Um, and what other people are doing. If there's a lot of other people leaving their stuff unattended and it seems relatively um, safe, then I think that's a pretty good indication. Uh, and it depends where you are as far as what people are likely to be traveling through that area. So I often think about it, you know, a rest area on the side of a highway, I'd be less inclined to leave our caravan unattended yeah. there because there's gonna be a lot of people driving past there that you're just encouraging that opportunistic person to have a bit of a crack at seeing if they could steal anything from you versus in a campground or something like that, there's likely to be other travellers around at some point in the day. They've probably seen you camping there. They're more likely to sort of notice if someone's snooping around and, it, and doesn't belong there. Uh, so it really just depends. I mean, again, if we're really remote and we've pushed down a side track somewhere and no one knows we're there, I feel pretty confident leaving the van or anything else there because, yeah, the chance of someone finding it at all is pretty unlikely. And even if they do, they're probably just snooping around looking for a campsite themselves. So they're probably just another another traveller. Again, it comes down to as well with the caravan, we're lucky we can lock everything up pretty securely. We don't actually have to leave anything out where it could be easily just grabbed or taken. Yeah, there's um, no way to get in through zippers or anything. No, easy. like, I mean, obviously you can break into it if you really wanted to, but it's going to take a bit of effort. Um, and so, you're not going to be very conspicuous doing it. Yeah, exactly. So there's some basic precautions I think you need to take when you are, um, and not just when you are leaving your van, but just in general around campsites. So one of the main things we use as security is a hitch lock. I'd highly recommend getting a decent hitch lock. Um, the ones we use is the Cruise Master one for our DO35 hitch. They're fantastic, um, really compact, very effective. Uh, and, and very easy to use and put on. So that's, that one's a bit of a no-brainer. You can go further along than that too. There's other options on the market for things like uh, wheel brace locks that lock your wheels together, even just putting a chain or some sort of lock between your wheels if you've got a dual axle van or through your single wheel through your suspension or something like that if you've yeah. got a... Yeah, if you've got a single axle. Like um, light tie systems. Yeah, different alarm systems and things you can get, GPS, trackers, uh, all sorts of things like that that you can go down if you if you want to add that added level of security. At the end of the day, it's insured. Um, if we're not in it and someone flogs it, it'd be a major problem, but it, it's not the end of the world, so to speak. 
And then just being sensible about locking things up, um, locking all your locks, obviously locking the door. Uh, our door being the two-piece door, allowing us to lock it and still have some airflow is super handy with the van, both when we're in it sleeping of a night time uh, or during the day even, and, and also when we leave the van unattended. And just not leaving too much stuff lying around, and not too much crap. And I guess there's also other options. So lots of caravan parks have caravan storage, which is much cheaper. So, you know, if it's 30 bucks a night for a caravan, it might be 10 bucks a night for storage. So caravan, check with the caravan park nearby if you want to do a day trip or like a overnight or somewhere. Um, hip camps and um, campsite hosts are usually pretty good too. If a camp has a campsite host, you can often, we've done this before where we've, you know, had a chat to the campsite host, said, hey, we're going to go here. Do you mind if we park the van on this site? Pay for one person per night sort of thing and um, leave, the, leave van. the van there. And they're more than happy to just keep an eye on it, knowing because they're aware of who's coming in and who's coming out in certain camps. So, you know, you have got other options as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've covered off now the precautions that we take to prevent a situation occurring or to minimise the chance of something happening. But what do we have in place or what sort of things are we thinking about uh, when it comes to dealing with a situation if it does occur? So what the really the main things we're thinking about here is uh, our be able to contact uh, help if we need it is first and foremost. So what communications we have. So first and foremost, really for us is communications. If something goes wrong at the end of the day, the number one thing you're going to want to be able to do is raise help or let someone know that you're in need of assistance. The first thing you're going to be doing is calling out for help or going to seek help from other travelers or anyone else, or anyone else that might be around you. Uh, straight, the first one you're going to pick up after that um, if there's no one else around or you can't help his mobile phone. Now, even though you might be off grid and remote, most parts of Australia or a lot of parts of Australia, you still do have access to mobile phone reception. So if you've got reception, obviously you're going to grab your phone. There's a great app we also have on our phone called the Emergency Plus app. Uh, I'll see, put that up on there. It's the little orange one down mm. there. Uh, so Liz will... Yeah, yep. can you so open we, it? So if we go into the Emergency Plus app, I'll probably have to get some different B-roll of this, but uh, so if you go into the Emergency Plus app, you can dial triple O from there. You can also contact the SES. There's also a non-emergency police number in there. So if you, obviously if there's someone snooping around a campsite or there's a theft or something like that and you don't actually need to call the police for an emergency, you can hit that one there. Uh, and it also gives you, the big one is it gives you your GPS location and your location wherever you are so that you can relay that information to the operator in an emergency. Uh, there's also a really cool feature that the emergency app call uses, which is called What Three Words? Now, what three words was a system that was developed, I don't know how long ago, it's relatively recent, but it's basically they took the entire surface of the globe and divided it into a grid uh, so that, and I think it's only like a three metre by three metre, it might even be less than that grid, uh, and each grid square of the on the entire surface of the earth is given three words, and it's like a unique three random words that gives it um, a location. And those three words are as accurate as GPS, and you can relay those three words to emergency services and they can use that to pinpoint your location it's a really kind of cool and clever system it's obviously just a lot easier to relay three specific words rather than trying to uh, read out gps coordinate coordinates or something like that so for especially where especially in an emergency situation yeah particularly in an emergency if you're trying to you know you obviously it's going to be potentially quite stressful and things like that so to be able to just recite three words and them to know exactly where you are is a pretty cool little feature for example where we are now, the three words are tribe, renewed, whispered. So if you're curious, Google what three words and type in tribe, renewed, whispered, uh, and then you'll see exactly where we were when we filmed this video here at Swimcart Beach. It's a pretty cool feature. So that one's a really good one, obviously, if you've got phone service uh, and the emergency app does work offline as well. So even if you're able to get an emergency call out via another communication method, that app will still give you your location, which is super handy. Next one for us is something that we've always got for a variety of reasons is our UHF. Now we've obviously got the one built into the car, but we also have a handheld that we can take with us if we're away from the car, hiking or something like that. Um, obviously it's a short range communication, depending on what repeater towers and stuff are around you, you'll have a variety of sort of distances that it'll be able to transmit, but generally it's about five Ks maximum, unless you can get a good repeater station. Uh, there are There is an emergency channel for UHF as well, so you can jump on the emergency channel and, uh, and transmit your your um, your emergency and see if you can get someone who may have a way of raising help for you or spreading that um, 
spreading the word that you need some help. So UHF's a handy one. It's one that most travellers carry anyway, so it's something that you're likely to have handy, and it doesn't rely on phone service, but it does rely on someone obviously listening in and being near enough to hear your signal. So channels 5 and 35 on a UHF are reserved for emergencies, so you use those, and they'll use any repeaters in the area to retransmit that signal. So in a medical emergency, we also have this PLB, which just lives here in our vehicle and is something that we can quickly and easily grab out. And this is an emergency personal locator beacon that'll send off a GPS uh, distress signal that is monitored by the Australian government through the, uh, I think it's the Maritime Board monitors these. And that basically sends out an emergency signal to say, we're in desperate need of help and we need it quickly. And But this is only for use uh, to preserve human life is its job. So it's not if there's, you know, um, to, flat or you're flooded in somewhere to recover your vehicle or your setup or anything like that. It's not for mechanical breakdown or until it becomes, or if it's likely to become an emergency situation that life is threatened, but that's what that's for. So we really like this because it's peace of mind. They're relatively cheap. This one was about $300. They last for 10 years, the battery in them. Um, and then they're basically throw away and you replace them. But so for about 30 bucks a year, it's pretty well peace of mind. We've had this for a long time before we started traveling full time. Downsides to them are they're a one-way communication. So you don't know that someone's received the signal or that, you know, how far away help is or anything like that. Uh, all you know is that you've set up that signal and that eventually someone will get that signal and come to you. So that is definitely the downside of them. But the upside is there's no subscription cost. It works all the time. Uh, it needs obviously no other uh, signal or anything like that. Whereas some of the other ones or most of the other ones that I know of that allow you to do two-way communication like the Zolio and some of the Garmin units and things like that require an ongoing subscription payment. So that's something you've got to decide, I guess, whether you think that's worthwhile or not. The next big one is that's becoming more and more prevalent these days is, is Starlink as well. Starlink's becoming um, a potential option. I, it's not something I would want to rely on in an emergency, but if you've got it there, you may as well set it up, or if it's already set up, use that to try and get an emergency sig signal out as well if something were to go wrong. So then apart from Starlink, obviously you've got the sat phone, the old trusty reliable sat phone. Again, the downside to them is the cost, uh, both the purchasing cost and the ongoing cost to keep a subscription going, although they are getting more and more affordable. Uh, but yeah, again, it's um, advantage is that it's two-way communication. So you can have a conversation with someone, get help, and you know how far away help is, which would be really good peace of mind. With the PLB, it could be something as simple as like one minute you're sitting around a campfire, the next minute you've got a child who's been burnt and you need help, you need it straight away. It's so easy. Like you just, you, when you need the right gear, you need the right gear. And it's just an amazing peace of mind knowing that you've got that gear in an event of emergency. I think, yeah, just having it, to not have that stress of, oh, what if this happened? Knowing that we've got all the stuff on us to deal with an emergency situation just alleviates a lot of that stress. So after communication, the next thing in a medical emergency that we take into consideration pretty seriously is first aid. Yeah, so we've got a few different first aid kits and we've got them in all different locations. So one is in our hiking bag that we go and take hiking with us, one is in the car and one is in the van. So it doesn't matter what's happening, there will always be one nearby. <laughs> it's not something we've done particularly well in the past. We've just gotten our act together pretty recently. Just before Christmas last year, we got a couple of new kits to really sort our gear out because we had a like a minor incident. I had got something in my eye at a camp one night and uh, Liz went rifling through our uh, first aid kit to try and find some saline to wash out my eye and it was an absolute proverbial shit fight. Yeah, just so, to find something really basic like saline. So this was our, one of our main first aid kits. We had two. We, this was the one from the car, and we've recently just gotten rid of the one we had in the caravan. Uh, this is, I've got this in 2004 in preparation for my first lap around Australia in 2005. So she's a little old. Uh, not everything in it is that old, although I'm sure some stuff is. It's been restocked many times over the years, but it was basically just a toolbox full of uh, just paraphernalia. So to try and find anything in there, it's not quick and easy. Uh, and the one that was in the caravan wasn't much better organized than that. It was worse. That. It's worse than this one. So that was our car and our caravan kits. And then we had this, which is our survival snake bite kit. Uh, we've had this again for years, probably had this. Seven years. Oh yeah, we got, got it when Harrison was born. When Harrison so. was born, because I was worried about him getting a snake bite. 
No, I wasn't worried about either of us, but this one I got when we went camping. So these are these cracking bite. little snake bite kits that have everything you need for obviously snake bite, but we also find that they're great little hiking kits because other than snake bite, the next main things you're probably like to likely to come across as far as first aid on a hike is sprains and strains and, and probably breaks. Yeah, yeah, and breaks and scrapes and um, and cuts. So this will cover all of that um, with just a few band-aids chucked in. So we just keep a few band-aids tucked in the back. You want to chuck quite a few in if you've got kids. If you've got kids like <laughs> ours. And that, that becomes our great little hiking kit. Now that lives in the hiking backpack, which lives in the car. So this is always in, in our vehicle, but it's also with us on hikes. And can we just say it is a really good idea to put it in the hiking backpack. We used to just have it in the car for the first year of our travels. And when we were on the Gibb River Road in Adcock Gorge, Simon was getting some photos of a uh, waterfall yep. and came across a coastal taipan. And even though we're only a kilometre from the car, I just had this panic of like, why did we not have that with us? Because yeah. I would have had to run back a kilometre, leave the kids and get back you know, with the EPIRB and the um, first aid kit, just put it in your hiking backpack. <laughs> it's much yeah. safer or whatever bag you take with you on your day trips. So recently, as I said last year, we upgraded and we got a couple more of the kits from Survival. Um, we, as we said, love the snake bike kit. So I think these are the best kits on the market by far, personally. And I've wanted to get them for ages. And that was that getting something in my eye was the catalyst for it. I was like, bugger it. We've got to stop mucking around with this stuff and get serious. So we got two kits. We got... This black one is the vehicle one, so this one's gonna live in the vehicle, and the red, big red one here is, sorry, nearly got ya. This is their home or workplace one, so this one's gonna live in the caravan. We don't just love these kits because they're the most extensive. Uh, it's more because of how well they're organized and just how good quality they are. These, I mean, as you can see with this snake bite kit, that's been thrown around in utes and cars and multiple different setups and taken all around the country multiple times and not any signs at all of wear and tear. Like they just, they're built well, good quality, and that's why we bought them. Um, bonus is they're an Aussie company, a uh, little family company on the New South Wales Central Coast. So they do amazing charity work too and natural disaster relief stuff. So they're awesome. Yeah, so. great little company. So we're happy to support them. And if you are interested in one of those, there is a link below where you get a small discount and we get a small kickback, which helps support this channel and our content. So yeah, if you are interested in getting one, jump over there. Yeah, see, they've got some good bundles and stuff there where you can grab a couple of kits and chuck them together. That's what we did to get the two. Yeah, like, there's ocean ones as well if you're into boating and things like that. Heaps, heaps, of, heaps of different ones. Pet so. ones even if you, yeah, if you want to have a first aid kit for your pet, they do pet ones, which I thought was pretty interesting. But anyway. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say too, we also put that PLB in the hiking bag when we go on hikes. Well, we try and remember to. Again, something we're not great we'll probably at. probably need another one. And second. Yeah, and so now we've got two of these. We bought a second snake bite kit, so one will live in the car permanently and one will live in the hiking pack permanently. I'd rather have two of them than none when we yeah. need one. And we've talked and we really need to get our act together and get a second PLB for the same reason, one to live in the car and one to live in our hiking pack. Just because it saves, there's already, if you go on hiking with kids, um, trying to remember everything you need, water, food, clothing, swim gear, whatever it is, you don't wanna have to be trying to remember to put your first aid kit in and your PLB in every time you're going on a hike. It just makes sense for it to live in there permanently. I don't like the idea of the vehicle PLB living in the hiking pack permanently uh, because yeah just the opportunity if we are in a car accident or something like that and need it in a hurry uh, it may be difficult to get access to so that's our reasoning for that but uh, yeah that's pretty much first aid covered yeah Other emergencies that we keep in mind are fire. So we obviously have a fire extinguisher and a fire blanket in the caravan. We don't actually have a fire extinguisher in the car and that's something that's been in the back of my mind for a long time. And even filming this now, I'm thinking that's something I probably need to make a priority is get a fire extinguisher in the car. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are towing or even if you're not, um, making sure that at least both two of you in your traveling party are confident driving, confident towing, so that if you are in a, uh, an emergency situation that you can get yourself out of it if your primary driver is injured or if for some reason can't drive. Uh, failing that, making sure that both of you or at least two of you know how to unhitch your trailer or caravan so that you can remove it, leave it and, and get out of there uh, just in the vehicle. So that's something we're always keeping in mind and I'm always trying to make sure Liz gets plenty of experience driving with the caravan on so that she can in a, at a pinch if we need to 
uh, get out of there. Something else a few people ask us about, and I've had this one a couple of times, is weapons, firearms and, and other weapons. Do we carry them for personal protection and things like that? Um, the short answer is no. I don't think that's necessary in Australia. Uh, I think it's a very Americanized mentality. Uh, at the end of the day, like I said earlier in the video, if someone's coming to attack us or whatever, they just want our stuff. They're just there to flog our stuff. No one's out there trying to hurt us. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to escalation versus de-escalation. I think by as soon as you pull a weapon on someone, uh, it immediately escalates that situation. Uh, I'm all about de-escalation. So if someone's threatening us, I would far rather just give them whatever it is, whatever it is that they're there to get and uh, send them on their way and the situation is ended uh, as far as I'm concerned. Firearms in particular, there's no way I would, I mean, I've been, I grew up with firearms and I'm pretty familiar with firearms and there's no way I would pull a firearm on someone and point it at anyone. Uh, I think if you're not going to use it, don't, don't pull it out and there's no way I would ever uh, be able to do that. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. It probably doesn't go through everyone's mind, but we do, we do get it a little bit. Uh, yeah, we do get asked it a lot. Oh, that sun's getting a little bit bright. Getting. Well, that... <laughs> Showing all the highlights. <laughs> Just choked on myself. Well, that wraps this one up, guys. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you got something out of that and maybe learned a couple of things. That's just how we think about safety and security when we're traveling off-grid. And I think, as Liz pointed out, it really just comes down to experience, getting used to yeah. it. And making sure you feel comfortable. Like, it's just a spectrum, and you've just got to find out where everyone who's traveling with you sits on that spectrum and then go from there. So, yeah. Uh, let us know how you go. Leave us all your tips for different setups and what you do for, you know, tents and camper trailers and rooftop tents and things like that. Leave all your tips down below and, uh, yeah, the community can use them as a resource. Is there anything you think we missed? Let us know if you did. Yep. If you do, congratulations again to Stuart Smith for winning that $100 voucher from Everything Caravaning and Camping. And good luck for those of you who are in the draw this week. All you got to do is subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, sign up to the Everything Caravaning and Camping newsletter. There's a link to that in the description below. If you've already done those two things on previous videos, then all you need to do is the third step, which is just leave us a comment below. Let us know you're in and uh, we'll be drawing someone at random in a couple of weeks in the next off-grid video to win that hundred dollar voucher so thanks guys really good luck <laughs> really enjoying uh giving those away it's it's a really cool uh yeah. cool thing we've been able to do yeah. and uh until next time we'll see you guys next sunday see you next sunday or come say hi on instagram <laughs> it's a shameless self-plug yeah. please come say hi on instagram